Okay, so welcome along, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to uh, SETICON 2, day two. Uh, today we're here with Mark Okren. Uh, my name's Adrian Brown, and uh, we're going to talk to Mark about uh, his career as a, a linguist and his uh, involvement with science fiction through his uh, uh, work with the Klingon language and the Vulcan language and, and some other stuff like that. Mark uh, devised the Vulcan language heard in uh, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, as well as a 2009 Star Trek film, and uh, he developed the Klingon language and coached actors in using it in uh, Star Trek three, five, and six, as well as episodes of Star Trek The Next Generation. Um, Mark, um, could you tell us a little bit about your uh, um, educational background and uh, how you got into uh, the field of uh, linguistics and stuff like that? Okay. And, uh, what led you to your current role at, uh, or to your yeah. role in the language of... Yeah, my educational background, I have a degree in linguistics. And, uh, my undergraduate studies were in linguistics as and graduate. I have a PhD in linguistics from Berkeley. I got into it by accident. Uh, first heard about it, I'd, ne I'd never heard about it before, but I went to uh, University of California in Santa Cruz, which is just over the hill here, when the school was brand new. And uh, all the students, all the freshmen had to take a, a course in addition to whatever else they were taking, so we would have something in common. And my hunch is, I don't know this for a fact, my hunch is that the faculty threw the course together about two days before the students sh showed up. And the course was called Language, Culture, and Society. And if you think about that for a second or two, there is absolutely nothing that doesn't fit into that somehow. <laughs> and what it turned out to be was an introduction to the faculty and an introduction to the disciplines taught at the school. So there was about a week of this and a week of that. It, it started with linguistics, but then there was a week of philosophy and a week of history and a week of literature and psychology and all these different things. So you learned about all the different disciplines, you got to meet the faculty. And of all those things, the one that was most intriguing to me was linguistics, which as I say, I'd never heard of before. So when that course was over, I took Linguistics one, or it wasn't called that, whatever it was. And when that was done, I took Linguistics two. And this was great, it was great stuff. Then summer came. Uh, and when I came back from summer, they'd revamped the whole program. So the course I was supposed to take next no longer existed. So they set up an independent study for me with one professor. There was only one linguist at the time, anyway. Uh, and I was basically doing original research, you know, as a sophomore, and I was hooked. I was absolutely hooked, and just grew from there. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about the technical details of what a linguistics course will teach you and, and what you were doing for your research? Yeah, well, linguistics is, is it's long and complex, of course, but there's a couple of aspects to it. One is, is the study of how language works uh, grammatically and in terms of vocabulary uh, and all that sort of thing. And the other one is language history, how language has changed over time, which includes how they're related to each other and how they influence each other and things like that. So it's, it's both of those things, sometimes individually and sometimes all mushed together. Right. And your research uh, at Santa Cruz? And the, my research is, was primarily in American Indian languages. Uh, mostly from the West Coast, mostly from around this area, uh, uh, you know, Santa, Santa Clara and Santa Cruz and San Benito County and Salinas and places like that, San Francisco. Uh, mostly languages that were no longer spoken as of the time I studied them. So all of my research, not all, most of my research was based on documentation, uh, notes that either anthropologists had written or missionaries had written or something like that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how did that, uh, your linguistics background uh, then lead to uh, a, a role in Star Trek? Yeah, another, one, another accident. Um, I got, worked as a linguistics professor for a little while uh, in Santa Barbara, but ended up with a postdoc at the Smithsonian doing research on California Indian languages, the best source of material in the languages I wanted to study were in Washington, D.C., not in California. And while I was in Washington, I met somebody who was telling me about a new technology being developed for television called closed captioning, which is subtitles on TV for deaf and hard of hearing people. And they told me that they needed a linguist uh, for reasons that we don't have to get into right now because it's complicated. But anyway, blah, 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 I ended up getting a job there. Uh, and after a while, we developed a technology to caption live programming as opposed to stuff that was on tape. And the first program we did was the Oscars in 1982. And I was in charge of captioning of the Oscars. And they're mostly, the, the, the program itself is mostly scripted. Uh, so they said, well, we'll give you a script, but you need to keep track of the changes and this and that. So I arrived in Hollywood about a week before the Oscars, called up everybody I'm supposed to call up, and they said, great, we'll have a script for you on Thursday. This was a Monday, so I had three days with nothing to do. 
And I got on the phone and started calling my friends in LA, and one friend said, where are you? Where are you calling me from? And I told her, and she said, that's like a mile from here. Come by for lunch. Well, where she was was Paramount Studios. That's, that's where she worked. Her boss was Harv Bennett, who at the time was the executive producer of Star Trek II. And I knew him too, so you know, my friends are making Star Trek, which is very cool, but that's all that I knew. And she's, uh, during lunch, someone else at lunch was telling me how they're getting together with the linguistics department at UCLA to make up Vulcan for Star Trek II. There was a little scene where Mr. Spock and a female Vulcan who we'd never met before uh, talked to each other. The scene was filmed with the actors speaking English, but now they're in post-production. They thought it would make more sense if they were speaking Vulcan. So they got the idea of basically hiring whoever this was at UCLA, I have no idea who they had in mind, uh, to make up gobbledygook, to make up gibberish that would match the English lip movements. They would dub it in, put in subtitles, and, and go along that way. And I told them I thought that was a good idea, and hiring a linguist was a good idea, because they would understand what, la what sounds you, the, the lips make, and what you can see, and what you can't see, and all that. And they said they thought it was a good idea too, but it had turned into a headache. And now this is 30 something years ago. I don't remember what the headache was about, but it was, a, it was not artistic differences or anything like that. It was phone tag or something. She says, I don't know what we're gonna do. We have to have this taken care of right away. And I said, what do you mean right away? It's gotta be done by the end of this week, which is exactly how long I was in town. I said, I, I can do that. You know? um, at that point, the associate producer happened to walk by and they said, hey, we just solved the Vulcan problem. What do you mean? So she told him. He says, come see me after lunch. So that's how it happened. Now the fact that I knew the executive producer is not irrelevant to the story because he wasn't hiring somebody he'd never heard of and stuff like that, but I didn't go there to make up bulk and I went there to get a sandwich, but this is the way it turned <laughs> out. Uh, and then um, can you tell us a little bit about how that, uh, how the Vulcan language then linked to your work with Klingon? With Klingon. Well then, so I made up the lines for, uh, for Vulcan. There was two lines for Savik, the the female Vulcan and two lines for Mr. Spock. Taught the actors how to do that one on my merry way, having taught Mr. Spock how to speak Vulcan, which was cool. <laughs> and thought that was the end of that. I thought maybe, maybe, maybe I'll be a footnote in a trivia book one day, you know, mm -hmm. that's all. Uh, about a year and a half later, Harv Bennett called again. He said, well, we're making another movie. Uh, the villains are gonna be the Klingons. He says, I discovered there's nobody in charge of Klingon language. You did Vulcan, you wanna do Klingon? You know? So, you know, as I've said in other contexts, every, every once in a while in life you're presented with a decision that's really easy to make, and that was one of them. So I said yes, but that was very different from Vulcan because Vulcan was, was, was basically lip syncing. Right. They're trying to match up the lips and Klingon was starting from scratch. Not quite, I mean, I went back to the first movie. The first movie had a little bit of Klingon in it that James Doohan made up. I didn't know that at the time. Uh, so I took his half a dozen lines, whatever it is, and kind of imposed a grammar on them. He had a three syllable phrase is that one word or two words or three words? Well, I don't know, it's two. And the first syllable is one word and the second two syllables is another word. Why? I don't know. Because you just have to start somewhere. And once I made the decision, we'd just stick with it and it grew and grew and grew, both in terms of the, the basic uh, structure of the, of the syllables for the words and also the sounds that I had available to me. And then I added more sounds to it, otherwise it would have all sounded the same. Right. So how did your work with um, American Indian languages inform the Klingon uh, language, or, or did you have other influences? There was a number of influences. Uh, I tried very hard to not make Klingon sound like anything in particular, except for, except for matching the first film. Uh, but you can't help but be influenced by what you know. And what I know is American Indian languages from, from the West Coast, and what I know is uh, Chinese and some Southeast Asian languages. So influences from those crept in but I'd suddenly realize, oh, what I'm doing here is just like Navajo. I'm not gonna do that anymore, but I didn't erase it. I mm -hmm. kept it, I made sure whatever I did next was as different from that as it could possibly be. So there's influences from a bunch of things in there, but hopefully there's nothing anybody can recognize. There's one suffix in there that I stole on purpose from the language I wrote my dissertation on. That's my little Alfred Hitchcock moment. That's it, everything else was, was an accident. Right. And uh, so can you take us through the, the, the process that you, you had to, uh, go through to convert a script into Klingon and, and the sort of thought processes that you had to come up with in your linguist background to, yeah. to inform that. Yeah, I was, I was the, the script contained the lines in English. Okay, they were in parentheses. And this is the one that's supposed to be in Klingon. So I would go through and say, okay, we have to have a line that means whatever it is, how I'm gonna do that. And just basically just made it up, just made it up. But kept track of, of what I was doing. So when that basic grammatical structure came up again, 
I would do the same thing. Or if that word came up again, that would make sure it was the same word. And at the time, when I, when I first started, I was doing that. The idea was to be, to be consistent. Okay, so, so it worked like a real language and so on. But it wasn't initially going to be a full language. I mean, I mean, it was structured as if it were, but it was, I was just making enough for the movie. So if a grammatical notion didn't come up in the script, or if a, certainly if vocabulary didn't come, in, come up in the script, I didn't make it up. I just made up what you needed. So for the phenomenal system, you know, I might have had first and third person, but second person never happened, so I, did, I, I didn't make it up. That kind of thing. And then so just kind of flesh it out, flesh it out, uh, and kept tricking myself. Because uh, when I put it together every once in a while, especially the, afterwards, because after, after, we, after we did the filming, and things changed as a result of the filming process, which we can talk about, uh, I wrote a book explaining how it all works. And in writing the book, I went back to my notes to explain how certain things work. And I realized that sometimes my notes weren't as good as, as they should have been. And I'd find four sentences uh, that exemplified the same thing. I said, okay, how am I going to explain this? Well, sentence one, two, and three, it's very clear what I'm doing here and, and how it works. Sentence number four, what in the world was I thinking when I did that? How does that work? How does that work? And it was really bugging me. It's like writing my dissertation all over again, because my dissertation was based on these manuscripts where there's these sentences that had to figure out how it works. Uh, and then I realized, oh, sentence number four wasn't in the movie. We cut that out. So no one's ever heard that before. I could just cross it out and, and get on with it. It was much easier than the dissertation in that way. But it was the same sort of, it was the same sort of experience. And, and so uh, you, you worked continuously, and they came back to you for more and more uh, Klingon. So mm. how did the language evolve over the time that you worked on it? And well, a couple, thing, a couple things happened. Well, first of all, I, when I made it up initially, just, just the lines in the script, I had my idea of how this language is going to work, and this is this perfect Klingon. And so on, and that was fine uh, until it got into the into the mouths of the actors, some of whom did a great job, and some of them didn't quite get it. Um, but initially, that was okay because initially, if someone said the line, well, well, it was, it was it was it was interesting because everyone was very interested in this language when we first started doing it. So when you make a movie after you shoot a scene, the director yells cut, then he checks with the camera person and the sound person to make sure everything was okay. And when Klingon was involved, he would also check with me. And the director was, was Leslie Glenner Nemo. Uh, so Mr. Spock would check with me to see, see how the Klingon was going. And I would say, it's OK or it's not OK. And I learned very quickly to mostly say, it's OK, whether it was or not. And if it sounded like Klingon, even though it wasn't quite what I had in mind, but it sounded all right, I'd say, fine. And I would make a note. Okay? And the language started to change. So mm -hmm. if the actor was supposed to say toe, but he said two, mm -hmm. two became the correct thing. Mm -hmm. you know, going forward. So it started changing in that way. And then we, uh, in post-production, uh, there were some lines that were originally spoken in English, and all of a sudden they wanted them in Klingon. Ah, because now it's not just, it's, it's the same back to the Vulcan approach of matching the lip movements, but now I've got this whole grammar and sound system and everything right. that, that has to go with it. So we introduced some new things grammatically and, and, and phonetically to make all that happen. And since no one's heard this before, it's okay. For, for the first movie, which is the third movie. Um, after that, I wrote this book, the, the Klingon Dictionary, explaining how it all works. And from that point forward, working on the language was actually much harder for me than it was before, because I couldn't just make it up. I had to go back and make sure I matched what was in the dictionary, because people started to pay attention and pay very close attention to this stuff. I discovered there was people out there learning it and talking to each other uh, uh, and writing deep analyses of, of, of how this language works. There's a, the internet came about at more or less the, the same time, which is, I think, one of the main reasons that the language spread the way it did. I don't think people would have been able to find each other in the same way. They would have somewhat, but not like they did after the internet was there. So there's a page out there with all the mistakes I've ever made and so on. And, so. and, and now Klingon can be written in English, right? right. Now, I'm not, I'm not a linguist myself, but did you uh, have, any Klingon special letters or special? Uh, I didn't. They ex the letters exist. There's, there, a writing system was developed by the art department right. at Paramount for Klingon. And initially, the written language okay, and the spoken language had no connection whatsoever. The, the written language was just artwork. Um, they paid attention to make sure that if a sign by a door uh, you know, and a sign by another door, they would say the same thing. So presumably, that means exit or, or something. Right. 
they would make sure that the writing on a control panel would be different from the writing on this control panel, and they would put spaces in oddball places so it looked like real words and things like that. But there was, it, was just, it was just art. Um, I have had discussions with the people who were making those things about trying to make it match up, but we'd never come to any final conclusion about it, including, you know, do you read it from left to right or right to left? Mm -hmm. And one of the guys there thought you should read it from the middle outwards, which is pretty cool. Anyway, uh, nothing ever happened about it. However, the people who, the, the, the Klingon-speaking community out there has adapted those characters mm -hmm. uh, and made them match with the language, and they used them. They use them. There's, there's several different versions of that floating around, but they use them uh, to write the language. But, but so far, anyway, you know, what we've seen on screen is, is just art. Right, okay. And, and so in a, in a, I think it was um, season three or something of, of The Next Generation where there's a whole lot more Klingon because Worf uh, has to go back and explain his father and, uh, right. and his relationship with the current Klingon high command and stuff like that. Were you still involved in, in, in doing that at that stage? Of yeah, what? yeah. What, well, what had my involvement with Next Generation came about. The first season of Next Generation, there's one episode with, with Klingons in it, and that's not me. That's, right. not, that's not my stuff. I don't know where that came from. I guess the, the writer of the episode did that. By the time of the second season, uh, that's when, when they were making Star Trek V at the same time. And I was on the lot at Paramount working on Star Trek V, and somebody came up to me and said, I used to have, this guy said, I, I had in my office a number of copies of the Klingon Dictionary. They've all disappeared. Isn't that weird? Someone came in and stole the copies of the Klingon Dictionary and nothing else. <laughs> so I, I guess I was flattered. Right, know? yeah. Well, it turns out it was the writers <laughs> who went in and stole it because they were working on an episode where they were going to speak Klingon. Mm -hmm. And they got the dictionary and they couldn't figure it out. They couldn't figure out how to, how to make it work. And then they learned I was there. So they brought me over and I said, well, here's you do this, this, and that. So suddenly I'm involved with Next Generation for that episode. Right and a few others. Um, but as time went on, the writers, some writers paid a lot of attention to the language. They always used it, but some of them paid a lot of attention to the language and someone less so. So sometimes the language that you hear was pretty good. Hmm. And sometimes, well, it's the right words, but the grammar right. is very strange. But my involvement became, direct involvement became less, but I would from time to time get a request. We need a word for, right. for someone. I got, a, I got a, a call once. Will you please make us a list of maybe half a dozen potential names for males, half a dozen potential names for females, and the name of the Klingon homeworld, because we're doing an episode when we're going to the Klingon homeworld, which we've never done before. Right. I said, all right, now this is important. This is an important task here, the Klingon homeworld, so what should it be? You know? So I made up several, several examples, and then they were gonna give it to Gene Roddenberry. He was gonna choose. So some of them were just names, just words, just sounds. Some meant something. I think one of them meant home world, you know, things like that. And some other something planet and so on. And they gave the list to Gene Roddenberry and they told me he picked one. They didn't tell me which one. He, he picked one. And I, so I didn't know what it was going to be until the episode came on TV. So I'm watching to see what, what, you know, what did they pick, what did they pick. And they said, in English, Klingon home world. They didn't pick any of them. Oh, I don't no. know what but, but some of my names ended up being characters. So, right. Yeah. right. Well, I want to uh, make sure that we open up uh, for questions from the floor. Yes, Cliff. Hi. Hi. Just one? <laughs> okay. Um, so I don't know much Klingon, but I, I read that you had left out deliberately the verb to be. Yes. And <laughs> then Star Trek VI happened. Yes. And you were asked to translate to be and allowed to be. Could you? Give me the literal English translation back from the Klingon. Yeah, what happened with that was in, in the script for Star Trek VI, there's lots of Shakespeare, lots of things from Shakespeare. That, uh, that In the script as originally written, a lot of those were in Klingon. So I had to translate little quotes from Shakespeare into Klingon, which was difficult because I didn't know what a Klingon petard was, you know. <laughs> but we had to do that. Anyway, one of the ones that was not in there originally was to be or not to be. However, I arrived on the set one day and the first person I happened to bump into was Nick Meyer, the director. He says, oh, good, I'm, I'm glad to see you. I have a new line. I was a little worried sometimes when, when, when people do things like that, you know, where are we going, especially with him, because he was very serious about, about all this. He's great, he was very, but he was very serious. And two, like two days before, I was walking, you know, how, how movie lots are set up like little cities. So I was walking down the street. And I was walking this way, and he happened to be walking the other way. And you've ever walked by somebody, and somehow 
you just know that they stopped. You don't see them, but so you just know. And I just knew that he'd stop. So I turned around and I was right. He'd stop and he's going like this. <laughs> and he says to me, you go too far. I feel, who did I upset? What, what, what actor complained? He goes, you go too far. I need a line that means you go too far. <laughs> so anyway, I thought, I thought it was going to be like that because I, I, have, I have another line need for the film. I said, okay, what's that? And he says, to be or not to be. And I said, okay. And I thought, oh no, <laughs> uh, because I make a big stink about the fact that Klingon has no verb to be, which I did for a number of reasons. One is to make it un-English like, because to be is such a big deal in, in English. Um, so I said, what if, what if he says, what if he says, to live or not to live? And Nick says, okay. He says, go tell Chris. Now Chris is Christopher Plummer. Right, big deal, Shakespearean actor. He's gonna have to say to be or not to be in Klingon. So I go there and Christopher Plummer's sitting there and he says, I wasn't sure whether he was interested in this Klingon stuff or not either at, at the beginning. Except then he started calling me Mark all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and one day I, I walked by him, he was sitting, sitting in his chair and I walked by, he's going <laughs> <laughs> He looks up, I'm practicing my Klingon. <laughs> anyway. So he wanted to know, how do you say to be or not to be in Klingon? And the word in Klingon that I'm stuck with, because it's in the dictionary, is yin. Yin means live. And there's a number of ways I could have done to be or not to be, but I did it really kind of down and dirty and simple. So it was live or live not, okay? Which is yin pa, yin bet. So I said that to him, and he says, yin? Yin? He says, that's, that's too wimpy. Think of something else, you know? <laughs> So I thought, and I said, okay, what, what, if we, what, what if we say tach pach, tach bet? And he goes, tach, tach is good, we'll keep that. Up until that moment, tach was a suffix that meant to continue doing whatever the verb was. So eat plus tach means keep on eating, walk plus tach means to continue walking, something like that. So I kind of promoted it to be a verb in its own right uh, that means to go on, to endure, to continue. So tach pach, tach, that means to go on or not to go on, to continue or not to continue, or something like that. Then they shot that scene where he says that about 7,000 times. So everybody, mm -hmm. everybody learned that line. Mm -hmm. Some other questions. Star Trek has uh, escaped, uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> Klingon has escaped the boundaries of Star Trek. It was an episode of Frasier. It's in the Big Bang Theory all the time. Yeah. I wonder if you're involved in those productions, and if not, how good of a job do they do? Um, I was involved with Frasier, because the, 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 if you saw that episode, Frasier wants to give a little talk at his son's bar mitzvah, so he asks this guy, Noel, to translate this little speech into Klingon, but Frasier does something that upsets Noel, so Noel's going to get even with him and instead of translating it, rather into Hebrew. Uh, so Noel gets angry with him, so he translates it into Klingon rather than in Hebrew, because Fraser doesn't know that, and he gets up and says that. So they gave, me, they gave me the lines in English, which was very flowery English, which is very hard to translate. Um, but I came up with the Klingon lines, uh, but didn't work with anybody. I just sent them to them in an email. So I didn't hear it until, until I saw it on TV, and I'm listening to it, and I'm thinking, something's wrong. Is something's missing, you know, <laughs> what happened? So I said, did I goof? Did I send them the wrong thing? So I went back to my email to see what I sent them. No, I, I sent them the right thing, but two of the lines happened to start with the same word. And I think what happened is when they typed up the script or something to give to them, they thought they did that line already because it started the same. Anyway, the Klingon-speaking community out there picked up immediately <laughs> that there was something missing. So we had a contest of come up with the missing line, given so now that you know what the English is. And, some of the stuff they came up with is better than what I'd come up with, so, so that's okay. Um, for Big Bang Theory, I've, I've never worked on any of those episodes. They, they get, it's interesting, when, the, when, when they're doing sentences in Klingon or, or, or catchphrases, they get them right, but there's, a, there's an episode with the, they play Klingon Boggle, and Sheldon is, is very interested in that. Everybody else is interested in something else, but he's busy making up his words, and I'm not sure where those Klingon words come from. But <laughs> there's presumably lots of vocabulary that I don't know. Yeah. No, they, but Klingon has, it's, it's gone out. It's, it's, it's gone out well beyond Star Trek. Not only on TV, there's, it's, it shows up in, in a number of movies and TV shows and stuff from, from time to time. But people have done incredible things with them. They've translated, besides Shakespeare, all kinds of stuff into Klingon. And 
a year, two years ago, there was a Klingon opera that was produced in Holland. It was, you know, all in Klingon with, with no surtitles, but everyone seemed to have understood what was going on in there. And singing in Klingon is just a little tricky, but <laughs> they did it. And, um, now Josh Abrams did uh, Enterprise a, a, a couple of uh, years ago, and I think there's another Star Trek reimagining in the, in the works. Do we, do we know if there's any Klingon that's going to sneak in? Somebody here? knows. Somebody knows. Okay. <laughs> we'll put that as a, leave that out there as a teaser. Any other, yeah, we've got another question there. Hi. Um, my question was, um, are you yourself fluent in Klingon to the point where you would, could just have a conversation with someone? No, I used to be embarrassed to say that. I'm not embarrassed anymore. Um, when, I, when I first made it up, as I said, I was making up lines of dialogue for a film, and that's all I was thinking. And then when I was make, compiling the dictionary, it was this great written exercise of doing it and, and, and fleshing it out, adding in the second person that I hadn't created originally and things like that, and also making up lots and lots of vocabulary. Because if I only had the vocabulary in the, in the book that was in the movie, meaning Star Trek III, it would have been a really skinny book. So I had to add lots and lots of words. I was just making them up. What do we need words for and stuff? I, I put little constraints on myself about what to make up vocabulary for. So for example, I didn't make up any words for anything having anything to do with Klingon culture or geography, which sounds bizarre, other, other than what's been established already. And the reason was that I'm not a writer. I'm not a, a, a script writer. And I didn't want to make up stuff that then some script writer would come along with later and violate that. I'll do it the other way around. Let the script writers come up with something, and I'll come up with the word for that. So it's just a lot of arbitrary words in there, just one after another after another. But I never spoke it with anybody. I never did conversa uh, written conversations with anybody. And other people do and have, and therefore, therefore they've learned it. And I know what they're talking about. And I, can, I, I know the grammar and stuff like that, but I'm not fluent enough to carry on a real conversation. There are people who can do simultaneous translation in Klingons. You know. So uh, they're the translators that we're going to need in the future for uh, when, the Klingon, <laughs> when we meet the Klingons out there. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we've come to an, the end of our allotted time here, unfortunately. But uh, if you'd like to uh, talk more with uh, Mark after this, please feel free to come up. Um, but please join me in giving a, a round of applause for uh, Mark. Thank you.